Kirk, for this week's PBT Extra, we have a lot to get through, including our picks. But first and foremost, let's start with the extension of the 10-day hardship contract. So it was the deadline was today, January 19th. Now it's through the All-Star break, February 17th. Uh, what did you think about that extension? I, I Probably what the league had to do. It's a little different than what, obviously, what the NFL is doing, but also the NHL, right, which is no longer going to test asymptomatic players. Uh, they're going to continue this more advanced testing. I think they're hoping that this is crested. You still have people going into protocols, including like Tyler Hero today and some other guys. Like, It's not over, but the number of players going in and the 10-day con hardship contracts are dwindling. But I think they want to keep it around. I think they feel like a lot of the nation, like they're, we're, we're weary of this, right? We're just, I don't know. but I don't think that they felt comfortable just abandoning it quite yet we're not out of the woods so i think that they just wanted to try it for another month i mean are you comfortable with that or do you think that they should take another path that moves them back to normalcy quicker well i think we've talked about this before covid has now become just uh essentially if you're thinking about managing a team like any other injury right yeah so you have to be able to have contingency plans um given the advances in in health and science recently just with regards to the covid 19 um variants but what's interesting though kurt is that uh, since Omicron didn't even like exist a couple months ago, <laughs> like I like the idea that if you have uh, the ability to put up bumpers on the bowling lane, if you will, like why not? You know, like why not play with bumpers, especially going through All Star break? I think this was just probably a, a low, like it's a low cost, low you know, like low risk thing. Just let's just extend it. Who knows what's going to happen in a month's time? Give us a little bit of extra breathing room. So I, I think it's a pretty wise thing to do. Yeah, I, I think you're right there, Mike. Nobody's comfortable predicting the future right now on anything. So, yeah, give yourself some give give yourself some safety. Now on to basketball, the actual gameplay. We have a lot to talk about about the Lakers. You know, I, I've looked forward to this conversation for a week now, Kurt, because <laughs> the Lakers are right around 500. They're sitting eighth, and it's so interesting. This team, uh, you have LeBron who's playing out of his mind right now. You know, and, and um, they've they have an All Star roster. It's like Space Jam except for in real life, Russell Westbrook, Carmelo Anthony, Anthony Davis, and they're sitting at 500. What's going on in LA? And will they be able to write the, the ship? LeBron actually re released an apology to Laker Nation saying they're going to fix this. Yeah, well, it, it's a great roster on paper, but look, LeBron is still at his, like you said, still pretty much playing at his peak at age 37, which is ridiculous. You know, he's, he is in the MVP conversation and, and, and been phenomenal all season. Anthony Davis hasn't played at that level and is now out injured. And while he's working his way back and, and could be back within a week, like he's getting closer, he just hasn't been the same guy. But look, Russell Westbrook is a huge name, but he is not at his prime anymore and not a questionable fit. Carmelo Anthony is one of the all-time great bucket getters in the league, but he's a bench player at this point. Like he's a guy who can get you buckets off the bench. And that's kind of how this team is. It doesn't, fit together terribly well, Corey. And that I, they don't defend well. The effort hasn't been there every night on that end. And it, they kind of count on LeBron to carry them. Corey, the guy getting blamed for this is Frank Vogel. It, he's the guy on the hot seat. I, do you see that as fair? Uh, see, right now, when you look at LeBron's stats, 28, almost 29. Let's just round it up. It's 28.8, 29, 7.5, 6.5. I mean, that's what he's putting up right now. And they're sitting at 500. It's one of those things where it's like it's like in football. If something goes wrong, all eyes go to the quarterback and the head coach. And if the quarterback's putting up those type of numbers, then the head coach falls. It reminds me of Luke Walton. Remember this? Yeah. So th this is what's so interesting about the Lakers, though, is when so LeBron gets there, right? And this is back in 2018, 2019. Luke Walton's the coach. They finish 10th in the Western Conference, right? Then um, they get Anthony Davis. They win a championship, right? In Frank Vogel's first year. Then Anthony Davis misses half the games last year, right? They finished seventh in the Western Conference. And this year, we've known about the injuries back and forth. Anthony Davis is like, stop, start, stop, start. What's happening? And right now, they're sitting eighth. To me, this is not about Russell Westbrook. And I know we want to focus on Russell Westbrook. He's yeah. from L.A., played at UCLA. You know, we're looking for answers from Russ. In my opinion, this Lakers team has always been about Anthony Davis. And you and I have always talked about this. He's the secret weapon. He takes him from being a good team, a 500 team, a 7th team, 8th team, 10th team in the Western Conference, to a championship team. When he's healthy and playing well, 
they are number one. No one can stop them. And when they're not, they're just not very good. So for me, it's not about Russ. It's not about Melo. It's not about anyone else but Anthony Davis. I, I think where Russ hurts them is that trade. That trade gave up so much depth. And so they come back and they don't have Kuzma this year, who left in free agency, but they they, they weren't going to pay him. To, they kept Talon Horton Tucker, and, and that was the decision. But Kuzma's gone. Montrezl Harrell's gone. KCP is gone. And over the years, you know, Lonzo Ball, all these – all this depth that was around them went away to weather some of these storms. And they counted on Westbrook to help them weather. Like oh, when LeBron's out or guys are injured, we're going to get more Westbrook. And that just, he, he's just not efficient that way anymore. So I think he hurts him in that sense. He hasn't lived up to it in that sense, but all the things we're discussing now, like you said, Frank Vogel's taking the blame. And I, I, I just, I'm not sure that their problems fall directly on him. My other question, I'll ask you, and I frankly would ask the Lakers front office this, if they're going to fire Vogel, who you got that's better? See, that, that's, and this is, this is the thing I think is unfair. I think Vogel does a phenomenal job of defensive schemes and, right. and putting his team in a position to be successful. I, I think he's great at adjustments, and, but I don't know who's better. And that's one of the issues. I, I think this is just an issue of patience. And I want to take your attention to the other team in L.A. Uh, let's think about Paul George, Kawhi Leonard not playing for the vast majority. I mean, for the vast majority uh, of this right. season for various injuries, right? How are the Clippers doing? They're sitting at 500, yeah. just like the Lakers. And the yeah. thing is, I, the Lakers have LeBron putting up 28, 7, and 6, and Russell Westbrook is playing every single game, and, and they're still competing at the same level as the kawhi -less and the Paul george -less Clippers. You know, and so that, to me, is what's so concerning about this, which I think is why you see executives and former Laker greats um, and all the Laker nation – like just lamenting online because they're saying, wait a second, how are the Clippers doing just as good as us and LeBron's playing the way he is, you know? And we got Russell Westbrook playing every day. Yeah. Tyrone Lue deserves credit. Since both of those guys went down, I think they're five and seven, which considering they're without their two best players is really impressive. Like it's not, he has got them, Tyrone Lue has got them playing at an incredibly high level. Remember Tyrone Lue was the first guy the Lakers offered before Frank Vogel got this job. They offered it to Ty Lu, but Ty Lu would not take the three-year deal and the requirement that Jason Kidd be his lead assistant. Hey, we're going to put your replacement like right here next to you on the bench. He said, no, I, look, I'm a championship coach. I have some leverage. You've got to give me. Vogel took that, and, and I, think that the, I think there was always a sense that he was disposable in the Lakers' eyes in a way that most teams don't treat their coaches. The Lake, it's, L.A. is a tough place to play because it's a short memory. And, it, and, yeah. and, and the standards are very high. So that's in L.A. We know it's a tough place to play, high expectations and short memory. But what about uh, the trades? Let's just do this briefly. You think about Rajon Rondo, one of the names in, in that, uh, that depth leaving Los Angeles. Rondo is a multi-time multi All-Star, multiple-time All-Star, and uh, one of the highest IQ players in the game. What does he bring to this Cleveland team? Well, just needed depth. They're, they're, and, and some veteran presence. Look, when Ricky Rubio went down, that's a big loss for them. And frankly, Rondo at this point in his career is not as good as Ricky Rubio. But he does provide some of that locker room intensity and focus and veteran presence and IQ uh, that they could use. And he can play some minutes. He's played, he's played improved, better ball in Cleveland with more latitude than he, than he did with the Lakers. So he gives them something. He gives them some depth at the point guard spot where they kind of need it just because they miss, and they've started to find their footing again. They, they kind of stumbled for a while after that loss, but they've had a couple of nice wins lately. So maybe they're starting to get their footing again, including uh, being the Nets the other day. And one team that is struggling for footing, although I've, I've watched them, the Pacers, and, you know, I, I went to school in Indiana. I like the Pacers. I just believe in Sabonis, and I like Coach Carlisle. I like what he's doing. They play hard. It's not translating to wins right no. now. It looks like there might be a, a big move with Miles Turner, um, he's been central to trade talks. It looks like he's sidelined beyond the February 10th trade deadline. Will he move? If he does move, what will be the the haul? It'd be pretty good. They want a, at least a young player and a first round pick back for him. Um, there's still teams that'll be interested in him. They'll want the medicals on that because, you know, a stress reaction in the foot, which is the precursor to a stress fracture, uh, you want to take your time with that. Big men with feet, foot issues are 
that's not good. Like you want to avoid that. So I think they'll take their time. It's going to be interesting to see what the Pacers do. By the way, they have the net rating of like a 500 team. <clears throat> they are just horrible in the clutch. They are the worst team in the league in the clutch. Last five minutes of a close game, they're dreadful. And that's how they end up here. Some of that's just bad luck. And some of that is, you know, you get in those tight minutes when everybody cranks it up at the end of the game. And hey, that's where your Kevin Durant's and LeBron James's and, and Steph Curry's and on and on. That's where they earn their money, right? Like you just, hey, crunch time, I can go get you buckets. And they don't, with all due respect to some very talented players like Sabonis and Brogdon, they just really don't have that guy in those moments. So um, I think that it's good. I don't think they're tearing that thing all the way down, by the way. I think they trade Sabonis or Turner. And so the, the Sacramento Kings are going hard at Sabonis. Like they would really like, they'll throw De'Aaron Fox in the deal. I don't know if the, I don't know if the Pacers want him, but like they're going hard at it. Turner could get moved. Uh, Karis LeVert is out there as well. Um, the injury makes things interesting. I just, I think teams are going to be a little more cautious with Turner. They're going to want to see where he is because if it's a more serious foot issue, then I'm not taking him on right now. Be something to keep an eye on. I, I want to bring your attention to Brooklyn now. So Kevin Durant, one of the clutch players you mentioned, um, sprains his MCL I mean, his left knee is out four to six weeks. Uh, we, we know that uh, in a recent interview, Kyrie Irving doubled down. He's, he's resolute in his um, stance to, to remain unvaccinated. And James Harden has struggled with injuries this year as well. So when you look at this Nets team that also was one of the teams that was decimated with COVID-19, with all that context, with all that background, how will they weather the next four to six weeks? So it's a really good question because their depth has been inconsistent, right? They, they've had games where they've gotten good depth play. They should get Joe Harris back in a few weeks, which will certainly help. Um, but I, you know, they have a lot of road games coming up and it's like 11 of 14 coming up before the all-star break. Um, that gives them a chance to get Kyrie back in there, but it does feel a little, they, they still don't feel whole without Kevin Durant, right? Is that, do you watch them? Do you get that sense that it's still Durant who's the linchpin, even though Harden can get you third and, and frankly, Irving, either of them can get you 30 plus any night without Durant. It's not defenses don't have to react the same. They're just Durant is such a presence and was playing at an MVP level. I feel, you know, I feel terrible because this kind of ultimately is going to be his undoing. Like, I just don't think he's going to play enough games now to compete with, you know, whether it's Giannis or Curry or, or Jokic or whoever, like who's going to play 70 plus games. I, it's going to be hard for Durant to make that up. It reminded me of last year when he was the all-star captain and he, he played such few games due to injury. And yeah. I was like, man, this guy's his sample size is so tiny, but he's playing at such a phenomenal <laughs> level. It's like undeniably the, the, the best yeah. player in the world right now, but he's only played, you know, a handful yeah. of games. If he just had a, a wider sample size, he would be like MVP, MVP. Yeah, MVP. no, he, he was he was on top of my little list for a while and has only slid because of availability. So it's going to be interesting, like you mentioned, Harris is one of my uh, favorite players in the NBA just because you know he's a guy who understands his role and does it extremely well every single night for you. Uh, yeah. And so when he comes back, I think that will create a lot, uh, like you said, it will relieve a lot of pressure, right? Because we know Kyrie and James Harden can go for 30 any given night. And we know that you know they can take over the game at any time. But one of the things is, you know, without Kevin Durant and his massive gravitational pull, for defenses, yes. you got to be able to have some outlet to, to keep defenses honest. And that outlet's name is Joe Harris. <laughs> you know, sharpshooter on the outside, you, you have to get to play honest. I'm curious to see how they defend over this stretch, too, because that's individual defense. Kyrie can do it. He's hit and miss. Obviously, it's never been hard in strength, though. He's a better team defender than people give him credit for. They don't they don't have like a lot of other lockdown defensive guys. And Durant sneakily is just because he's so long and such a smart player, it's kind of always in the right place, making good defensive plays, can take on a heavy defensive role for a stretch and not having that, that's going to hurt them. I don't know if we're going to see more Nick Claxton or what they're going to do, but they're going to have to find a way to get stops over the stretch. It's interesting because when Kyrie uh, had his first game back, I, I remember I was thinking, okay, well, how, how will Kyrie adjust? Obviously you want to know physically because you haven't been practicing at that level, yes. but I was also curious just mentally, like what is his mental acuity at this point? state and at the time you know the nets were one of the better defensive teams in the league 
And there was this, there were a couple of late defensive rotations, but there was one time in particular where Kyrie was standing next to Patty Mills, who at that time had played in every single game this season. Mm. Uh, and he was directing him. He's like, hey, shift, shift. He was, you could see him pointing on the, def- on the defensive rotations. And that was what stood out to me. I was thinking, wow, this guy hasn't played for months. And he's still on top of the defensive rotations, more so than Patty Mills, who's played every single game, you know, at least in that instant that he could help, you know, take them to another level um, immediately on the defensive end. So I, I, that was a promising sign for me. Um, so as we see the next four to six weeks, uh, it's nice to at least to know that they might have a little bit of booster you know, more than we might have assumed. But we're going to see, like you said, over the next few weeks. And the first test is a Wizards team that uh, just beat the 76ers. They are still good. They they got off that rock rock and start, right? Like they were just right out of the gate. They looked amazing. They've kind of come back to earth since then. Obviously, injuries and COVID are a little bit of that. But I still think this is a dangerous team on any given night. Um, Montrezl Harrell is playing great off the bench. The Spencer Dinwiddie acquisition. <clears throat> Beal's been in and out of the lineup uh, with COVID. But uh, this is still a dangerous team most nights. It's still a well-balanced roster. And uh, – they're not competing for a title, but as we've talked about before, with where where the Wizards have been the last few years, like there's a lot of people in Washington, like pretty happy with where things are. Like this is a playoff bound team, or at least a play in bound team. What, that's I mean, a big step did, forward. That's a huge step forward. I think about you know in my experience growing up, the most exciting Wizards team well, was the one that had Michael Jordan, right? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> And then it was just kind of like I didn't hear anything from DC for a while, so it's nice to see some hope again. Yeah, there, and, hey, there were some there were some entertaining Gilbert Arena sitters in there, man. Hibachi was always fun, but they weren't terribly good. So now, though, this brings me to the uh, my favorite part of the show, the PBT picks. So we're we're in that squarely the mid season before the All Star break. Let's start with MVP. Who's your pick for MVP? It's a tight race. Right now, I think that there are LeBron's in the mix, Curry's in the mix. I went with Giannis Antetokounmpo, who I think has been lifting the Bucks up to where they are right now, still one of the top four seeds in the in the East, playing on both ends, putting up points, putting up assists, but also has been asked to do more. With Brooke Lopez out, he's played a lot more center and had to do a lot more rim protection and not been able to just be you know, the defensive free safety that they'd like him to play. He's had to play a different role, and he's thrived in it. He's blocking shots. He's making plays. I think they've asked a lot more and a lot different things of him, and he continues to just play at this unbelievable level. So I've gone with him, but in a – it's a really tight race. And if you – like I said, I think Durant was in there. Yeah, we'll see. Curry, obviously. LeBron. I think that the Jokic, Nikola Jokic is in there. So – any of those could do it, and then I think it goes down a tier to uh, the uh, Jimmy Butler was there. I just don't think he's played enough games. Um, DeMar DeRozan, whoever else you want to put there. Yeah, for me, I agree with you. It has to be Giannis. It just has to. And yeah. it's it's crazy because um, I mean, you look at his numbers. It's like he's thirty <clears throat> points with twenty eight and a half. He's six in rebounds with eleven point two. Yeah, he had six assists. I, I mean, for a six eleven guy to have twenty eight eleven and six assists. That's crazy because I, mean, I mean that's why we love Jokic. That's why we love guys like Giannis because you understand that when you collapse the defense and there's two or three guys on you at all times, you got to be able to pass the ball and get other people involved. Then you throw in who does he pass the ball to? How about Chris Middleton? You know how about yeah. uh, Pat Connaughton? How about the guys who the shoes around them and gets and everyone they, involved <clears throat> for winning the, games? Don't leave off that list. They've struggled a little of late, and it shows how much they miss Drew Holiday. I think they've gone four and eight without him, four and nine without him. Drew Holiday is vital to that team being who they are absolutely and and what what to me the 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 biggest thing though on the Giannis case just really quick was the Christmas day game yeah because this was after he came out of COVID protocol hadn't played since the the 13th of December uh against the Boston Celtics where they lost then he comes back and in 30 minutes after what 12 days out he shot 56 percent from the floor I mean he had 36 points, 12 rebounds, five assists, two blocks. Yeah. In 30 minutes. Like, when you think about efficiency, like, tell me another player who plays 30 minutes and gives you 36, 12, 5, and 2. 
And that's why he's the MVP. Like to me, in, in that sense, he's always and he's been like that every year. I just don't understand how you keep doing that and get better and better and better. I, we're, it's gonna, it's unbelievable, Kurt. I, I just cannot. It's amazing to me. After I saw that game, I was like, this guy's MVP. Yeah, he's he's been he's been unbelievable and and deser- and, and deserving this. And like you said, you know, the year he won, he didn't play. He played a little over thirty-one minutes a game the last time he won it because. They were blowing everybody out that year. It's unbelievable. And then now let's move on here to rookie of the year. Who do you have? I think it's kind of clearly Evan Mobley. Um, I, I, he has been scoring points and better offensively than expected. But more importantly, he's borderline all defensive team. Like he has been so good defensively, especially next to Jared Allen. Yeah. That really makes look, the surprise Cavaliers are based in large part. Like, yeah. Look, other guys, Okoro's taken a step forward, and, and Darius Garland's taken a step, big step forward. But Evan Mobley solidifying that back line has been critical for them. So, yeah, the other rookies are, look, Cade Cunningham is coming on. Um, Franz Wagner has been shockingly good and, and absolutely has to be in the conversation. But I think they're kind of all a step behind Mobley, who has been the best to me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Full stop. It has to be Evan Mobley when you think about impact. Uh, now let's move on to to coach of the year. Who do you have? It's so wide open. I don't. I don't do you have an obvious? Was anybody obvious to you on this one? Yeah, actually, yes. This one. one? I, I for me, I agree. It is wide open, but it has to be Billy Donovan. Because for me, the Chicago Bulls, we talked about it last year when we saw the sh- like the the shakeups. Like there had to be a change. Otto Porter Jr. was making twenty eight million dollars a year. Like he was your franchise player, but then Zach Levine was on the rise. Where were you going to put the 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 franchise around? Who were you going to build around? Right? And then uh, they basically clear house, right? And then when one season they go from being that's the Chicago Bulls, like you know, don't you know where you play? Don't you know the history of this organization? They're not very good to now consistently, not just like the Wizards who had a flash and then went down. I mean, the, the Bulls have consistently been atop the, the Eastern Conference right in the conversation. I mean, DeMar DeRozan to come from, you know, yes, he's been playing well. But now, like you mentioned, there might be an MVP, an MVP case for him. You know, people are calling it a renaissance. I think that's a, uh, an unfair term because he's only in his early 30s. You know, he's like in the prime of, uh, of the athletic career so how can that be a, a renaissance so early but you know but at the same time you know like everyone around him Zach Levine continues to elevate his game uh, Caruso looks great with him I think Billy Donovan's done a phenomenal job taking a team that we didn't know how it would fit together at all it, it did it was not apparent yeah. and having them consistently perform um with the Nets with the Bucks with some of the best teams in the Eastern Conference I, see I went sort of similar in thinking but a different direction because I had actually chosen Taylor Jenkins Mm. of memphis that's really and, uh, cool. another player where i think what really solidified how he's built a culture and really developed players there was john morant goes out for 12 games and they go 10 and 2 yeah. like the the their best player sits and that's another team that thrived and said all right well everybody do this and, and they've been they've missed key guys so i think he's in the mix uh, jb bickerstaff has to be get a mention in cleveland um I, by the way, the other sneaky, really good candidate in there, Eric Spolstra. The Heat are second in the East right now. Like, they have really built something solidly there around Bam. Well, around Bam and Butler, but those guys go out, and suddenly it's the Max Struces of the world are are making plays for that team. So I think all of them, uh, obviously Billy Donovan too, I think it's – that's why I said I think it's wide open. I think there's a lot of coaches who can make a case right now. And I really like that that young player, Omar uh, Yurt Seven. Yes, like, he's been I'm, I'm, like, I remember watching him in the preseason. He played the Spurs and I was sitting at that game watching him. I was like, oh, my goodness, who is number 77? I, I, I really I, he's been consistent as well for him. I really like him. So six man of the year, Kurt, who do you have? It's wide open because to me, like the best six man of the year would actually be Jalen Brunson, except he's had to start and he started more than half their game. So he doesn't even qualify. Uh, there's a couple guys like that where guys have been forced into bigger roles than expected. And, you know, the. Petty Mills and, and the like may come back to it. We'll see. Um, right now, I would actually go with Montrezl Harrell, who is coming off the bench. In I, I think Tyler Hero is right there. It's really close. But Montrezl Harrell coming off the bench with the Wizards, you know, they're plus 8.3 per 100 when he's on the floor. Like, he just comes in, burst of energy. They're better. Becomes a matchup problem. I just – 
he's back to playing like he won it with the, and the numbers are similar to when he won it with the Clippers or using him in pick and roll. So I, I'd go to Trez right now, but it's close. What about you? Yeah, it would have been for me. It would have been Jordan Poole had he not started 31. You know, it's like to me, like yep. you know, if, if Clay would have come back earlier and Jordan Poole would have been coming off the bench, it, to me it's just been like, oh, that's it's Jordan Poole. Uh, but yeah, I, I think those are really good picks. And finally, most improved. Who do you have? I think there's a few candidates, but I think my top two are both Memphis Grizzlies. Um, I would go with Desmond Bain, who has been in his second year, just made this leap to critical rotate, not just critical, like foundational piece for them. Um, he's gotten more efficient while taking on way more scoring load and being asked to do a lot of different things. So, to me, he'd win, but I think you can make a really good case for John Morant, who made, Corey, he made the capital L leap, not just a leap. He made that, I'm good. I'm franchise cornerstone, all-star starter, all NBA leap this year. He's been that good and... That's a hard leap to make. Players will tell you that might be a harder leap than from okay to good. So uh, those were my two. Did you have someone else? Yeah, I, I, my, my mind goes to Darius Garland. Yep. I, I've been really impressed with the with the ability that he's shown this year. I mean, taking once again in Cleveland is pretty good. Uh, but he yeah. has, has really improved as a player. In, in my other estimation, I'm trying to think. I mean, it's, it's hard for me because I know people are throwing around Andrew Wiggins. And to me, it's hard to to have him in the conversation just because he, you know, is a former number one overall draft pick, franchise player who now is in the right system for him playing, you know, a role that helps his team win games. I don't think that's necessarily most improved. I think more the Darius Garland level is more more most improved. And I think like I mentioned it before with six man of the year. You know, I, I really do think Jordan Poole should get some award this year. <laughs> and I think if, if it's not, most improved is, is going to be pretty good. Because, I mean, last year to this year, Jordan Poole has shown he's, that he can start another guy alone, yeah. next to Steph Curry. I mean, it, that to me alone, with a, if you're telling me who are the most important players on the Warriors team this year, pre-Clay, and even, you know, moving forward, yeah. you would have to say one, Steph Curry, you know, two, Draymond, three, Andrew Wiggins, and then four might be Jordan Poole. You know, and that to me, that's most improved. Yeah, that I think there's a really good case there. And I think it'll be a different conversation with six man when we get to the end of the year. And Jordan Poole is played more minutes off the bench than as a starter. And same with Jalen Brunson and some other guys. It kind of it'll change the conversation a little.